I know a lot about growing tea around the world, a lot about growing tea in parts of the USA, and Mark Gaskell, who is um, from UC Davis Agricultural Natural Resources, is going to be specific about growing tea in California, which is what he's been helping with for some time. And to prevent any arguments, um, Norwood will be in the middle. Although, knowing Norwood, he may well cause a few arguments. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, why am I so interested in growing tea in the USA? Um, it's been uh, quite a long time since I first came. Um, in fact, the first time I ever set foot on the, in the USA was to work at the uh, Lipton Tea Research Station in Charleston. And that was back in 1984. And um, I was working for Unilever Research, and um, because um, Lipton was part of Unilever, I got sent over to work in the, the uh, tea station. Then um, Unilever decided to sell the tea station, and they sold it. And um, my next um, interaction with tea in the USA was... I used to make a little um, miniature tea factory and um, when I was with Unilever and we sold one to Lipton when they had um, a joint venture with Alexander and Baldwin in Hawaii to grow tea in Hawaii because the sugar crop was, um, well sugar was getting so expensive to produce in Hawaii they wanted to diversify. So they diversified they thought they were diversifying to tea. Um, that turned out to be not such a good idea. I oh, uh, can talk about why in a bit. And my next um, interaction was actually to, um, I had a tea client in, on Kauai, where we set up some tea for her, and another tea venture on Big Island um, in the, um, in about 2004. So I've been coming backwards and forwards to the U.S. on tea for quite a time, and now I've got um, I've had several uh, clients help them in Alabama and Mississippi in particular. So I thought the first thing we should do is to have a little look at why you know the history of tea growing in the U.S.A. It's um, it's a fairly fascinating history. History, it's um, not necessarily successful. But the reasons why it's not successful is, um, is it illustrates some of the problems. So, it's, the history started in the 18th century. Um, a botanist called Andre Michaud Got to see, he was working in the States, uh, growing all sorts of plants, helping the government um, diversify their, uh, their crops. And he got seed from camellia, camellia seeds from sailors coming in on the ships from China and tried growing them. So that he had seeds for, of sonensis and he had seeds of camellia japonica. And people were assessing it really on the flowers and the japonica won out and the tea plants were left to die. In the mid-19th 18, mid, mid 19th century, um, a Dr. Julius Smith started experimenting with growing tea. And that was um, work, they were growing it in South Carolina at Greenville. And the government got interested in 1858. They sent Robert Fortune out to China. Now, you have all heard of Robert Fortune, who uh, stole the seed that um, was brought into Assam. Well, Robert Fortune made several visits to China. On his fourth visit, he brought seed to the States. He wasn't too happy because the Civil War got in the way and he never got paid. <laughs> Anyway, those seeds were, um, they were handed out to farmers in six of the southern states, but with the Civil War, um, nothing happened. So, it, interest was rekindled in 1880 when um, 
the then Commissioner for Agriculture uh, recruited um, a guy called John Jackson. He was one of the inventors of the rolling table, incidentally. Um, they recruited him to plant tea on 200 acres, again in South Carolina at Somerville. And they imported seed from China and from Japan and from India, uh, plus some from the Robert Fortune uh, exercise. But that was abandoned because of J Jackson's ill health, so nothing happened. So it was revived in 1890 by a chemist called J Charles um, Shepard. And he was the first one really to make any success at all of growing tea. And he was the one who really discovered what the problem was. They were competing against countries where the labor price, the labor cost was much cheaper. His solution to that was to um, re recruit children to pick the tea. Yeah, I know it's not quite ethical nowadays, but the deal was that the children picked tea in the morning and they received an education. He set up a school for them, so they got educated in the afternoon. So that went on quite well. He produced quite a lot of tea, which was sold for him by another company. But on his death, it sort of fizzled out. But it went for about 10 or 20 years on that basis. He established a name for a local grown tea. In fact, he got up to um, about 125 um, acres. And his peak production was 15,000 pounds of tea a year. Now, in parallel with that, another um, entrepreneur Major Roswell Trimble um, set up uh, a commercial operation, much more commercial than Dr. Shepard's. It was called the American Tea Growing Company. And they um, actually purchased 6,500 acres of land, rice land, in South Carolina um, and set up quite a thriving business. But again, when um, Major uh, um, well, it was, it was Trimble's boss, actually, when he died in 1903, the venture collapsed. So those, those tea plants and the tea plants from Somerville um, actually formed the collection that were called the Pinehurst Collection because they were growing at Pinehurst. That formed the collection which Unilever, or T.J. Lipton, purchased and brought from Pineville to Wadmore Law Island to set up the tea research station and they tested um, they developed cultivars there over they were there for 20 22 years they developed cultivars and they s sent them out to outstations in uh, Georgia Florida um, Mississippi Alabama Texas and California and as Mark will tell you a little bit later, some of those plants are still growing in, uh, in California. So Lipton closed that station down in 65. Um, in fact, I did the due diligence on the sale. Um, I recommended that um, it was not sold, that it remained within New Liver. They took no notice at all of my report and sold it. So it was sold to the manager there and um, and Bill Hall, a, um, a tea taster. And they ran it for 10 years, and then they fell out, like partners often do, and um, it was bought by Bigelow. And um, Bigelow are still running the station. And the plants, if you go there, um, you'll see um, those plants who have a really long history that goes back right the way back into the mid-19th century. Okay, so that's a little bit about the history. And the real reason why it's failed on so many occasions has been the labor cost. Now, why is it going to be any different this time? And the real different, the, the difference is that, um, ah, <laughs> well, before we go into, <laughs> at the moment, with the specialty tea trend, um, tea is tea growing, as it says there, tea growing is growing fast. 
Um, this is um, an example of tea which we worked with with uh, Jason McDonald in Mississippi and we planted that in 2015. It was in the nursery in 2014. And um, you'll see that the, the tea plants are very small there in 2015, but given the right conditions, um, look at those plants in 2018. I'll show you, the, show you that again, 2015, young plants just recently in and 2018 and we're plucking and that tea is winning prizes now. That tea last week I had the honour of being with Jason in Fortnum and Mason in London where his tea was launched at Fortnum and Mason. Tea from those bushes. So the reason we can do it now is the because of the specialty tea trend. Because specialty tea is a getting so much attraction. Uh, if you look out there on the floor, you see how many people are interested in it. And the thing about specialty tea and specialty tea buy, um, purchases is that price is not so important. It's the quality that's important. So because we can sell it at a higher margin, then we can afford the expense of growing it in the States and in Europe as well where things are much the same. So that is what's causing it. Now I'll show you some figures which um, if I had to make them up I would I, you know, I would not be so adventurous but these are figures from the US uh, Tea Association yeah US Tea Count US Tea Association um, these are specialty tea sales, which are from 1990 um, there to the present day. So you see in billions of dollars of retail sales that 30 years ago, it was around about nothing. And that growth has been absolutely spectacular. Now you'll see that that, uh, gra that graph is only up to 2014 there. Um, the prediction for 2020 um, is you'll see an extra dot on the, on the graph. Well, you should do. Where's it gone? There it is. That is where it will be in 2020. Two and a half billion dollars sales every year. So it's nearly a fifth of all the sales value of tea in the States will be specialty tea. Not volume, of course, but value. And it's that value that actually will make it possible, will make it successful. Now, the, the key drivers for specialty tea, um, health, of course, novelty, um, the quality, the taste. That is what's pushing the US tea market up and specialty tea particularly. And that the trend to specialty tea is um, because people are interested in new origins, because they, people have a quest for excellence and because specialty tea really is so different from commodity tea that it's, it's, something, it's something new and something people are aspiring to. So there's, that is driving specialty tea sales, but also distrust of tea coming in from overseas because of its high, or at least perceived high levels of pesticides, um, unease about working conditions, um, people plucking. Um, now, not all of these, I say perceived because not all tea coming in from outside has high levels of pesticides, but the perception is there that it could. And it certainly could, but there are a lot of controls which um, eliminate that but the perception is there that if it's grown in the States, we can trust it better than if it's grown outside. 
And there's questions too about fair trading, whether people are really getting their, paid for their work. And uh, the trend to localism, um, food miles concern. Um, people are rightly um, concerned with that, with the uh, environmental aspect of bringing tea in from necessarily from very, very long way away. And of course, patriotism. Um, people, I am always, um, I've come to the States a lot, but I'm always surprised when there are so many Union, uh, union Jacks, <laughs> so many Stars and Stripes on view, so many flags, people are so proud, you know, outside their house they'll put uh, a flag. Um, many countries, you know, you might get a flag on a special occasion, but not, you know, not every day. So there's a lot of patriotism and I think a lot of that spills over into locally grown tea. So what we're here, we're here today is to um, to talk about um, growing tea in the USA, and um, we have Mark, who, as I said, knows some specifics about growing tea in California. Um, you might have heard Catherine Burnett yesterday um, from UC Davis talk, and Mark is associated with the same um, university. So we'll we'll uh, move into. Um, discussion format and um, any questions we'll try and answer them for you. I'm Mark Gaskell, I'm a farm advisor with UC Cooperative Extension in the Central Coast, San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties of California. I spoke yesterday at uh, an extended session, uh, some of you may have been there, but for those of you who weren't, I'll summarize for you briefly our conceptual approach to growing tea on small farms in California. Uh, my job with UC over the past tw more than 20 years has been to support small farm agriculture and help develop specialty crops in support of small farm agriculture. Our small scale uh, growers are challenged by competitive uh, uh, marketplace. Uh, we can rapidly learn to grow almost any crop in California. Uh, to the extent to which we saturate the market and crash it and, uh, and farmers go out of business because they can't survive with prices the way they are. So we've learned over time that often we can solve the growing problems, but we really need to start from the marketplace and work our way back. And we need to be thinking almost from day one of the market and work our way back through growing. So. <clears throat> taking advantage of Nigel's comments about the burgeoning U.S. tea market and uh, worldwide appreciation, greater appreciation for specialty teas, combined with our setting in California of a established tourism base, massive tourism base, and specifically um, agritourism related to wine tasting, related to olive oil tasting, related to uh, small farm, uh, pick your own berry operations, uh, diverse types of agritourism ventures, I will call them. And we have uh, goat milking and huge array of interesting options for v visitors and for curious uh, uh, tourists and other customers, potential customers, to enjoy. And um, so we have uh, buses and, and limousines on a daily basis year round in our area between cruising between San Francisco and Los Angeles all through our area doing wine tasting and some of these other types of agricultural venues. We've well established that we can grow tea in California and, and uh, Nigel just showed you that they've been growing tea essentially for 200 years in California I mean in uh, the United States but can you make money on tea? And that's been the issue. It, uh, the other part of the story was that in the past they haven't made money because of challenges from labor, primarily, but challenges from competitiveness in the estate tea marketplace. So we propose, and the other thing I haven't mentioned to you is our growers are also challenged increasingly by labor availability and the cost of labor. 
So what we pretend to do is shift labor and the cost for labor to the consumer, to the customer, and charge for the educational experience of pick your own, process your own tea and related tea ceremonies and tea educational programs around tea. And then in some cases, uh, many of these are sophisticated operation, can move into tea tasting uh, venues, uh, small tea shops where they would sell other teas from other parts of the country or other or Hawaii or other parts of the world. And of course, teaware and a vast uh, array of other additional materials. If that type of operation fits with the other part of the farm and with the other activities that the farmer's involved in. So that's briefly what we're talking about. And I explained in more detail, and some of you will have access to that video, and I'd be happy to answer your questions, what kinds of infrastructure might be involved in this. But the kind of garden setting that you saw with 400 foot rows or four, uh, 200 foot rows of tea might be a tea garden that might at one time uh, contain four or five varieties of tea, and you might, uh, at w during one period of time, entertain 10 to 20 people in there picking tea, because we're talking about a fairly small uh, requirement for land and actual agricultural planting, and but then the associated processing and management of that and turning that into a uh, business and turning that into an income stream is are the challenges that we're now working on and how we might uh, set up various alternatives whereby the consumer would come in and spend an hour or two at the farm or in some cases with ceremonies maybe a longer period of time and may come back more than once and may come back with other groups and because we have that kind of experience with agritourism and with tea ceremonies but not the two combined thus far. I'm happy to take questions, as are the other speakers. Can you give us a working definition of what you mean by a specialty tea? I'll go first on that because I was asked this question uh, last week. Um, we launched the European Tea Society last week, and um, the European Tea Society, like your um, ASTA, the uh, American Specialty Tea Alliance, um, two, the two societies are almost in parallel. Um, Tony Jubelli and I met in China last, um, by accident, uh, we met in China, as tea men do, and uh, we got together and um, said, what, what we really need is um, some sort of group organization that represents specialty tea um, producers, makers, growers, vendors and drinkers. So um, the question I was asked was, okay, if that's what you're going to try to do with the European Tea Society, why is it specialty tea in the title? Now the reason that we left it out is because, just as the question implies, it's very difficult to define. <laughs> and thank you for the question. I was asked, so I'll tell you what I said then. I said, well, firstly, I would specify that any tea that was sold in a supermarket for sure is not a specialty tea. But my real answer is that any tea that is excellent in its kind, that shows love in its production, we can be calling a specialty tea. So. That includes CTC teas, which people tend to be sniffy about, but I have seen uh, CTC teas which send shivers down my back. They are so beautiful in their kind. They are really superb. Oh. Um, it would include tea, some tea bag teas. So it's possible to have a specialty tea in a tea bag. Um, if the tea bag is an appropriate tea bag, it's got lots of space, it's, um, it's, it's uh, of innocuous taste and providing the tea in it is what we might call a specialty tea. So, no, there isn't really a definition, but I go for the one of the, um, if the tea shows excellence in its kind, then that is a specialty tea.
Amen. <laughs> uh, you see, this is why we tea amateurs, we lovers of tea, love coming to the Northwest Tea Festival. Where else are we going to have men of this distinction who know what they're talking about tell us things that we could nowhere, no wise other, otherwise uh, learn? Hey, uh, Mark, you have 20 years now have been coaching Californians uh, in all kinds of crops, but tea, I suppose, is fairly recently come on your radar. Is that fair to say? I mentioned uh, very briefly to the group yesterday that I first became interested in tea as a potential small farm crop in California uh, during the early 2000, 2002, 2004. I was working with Dr. Francis Z who was instrumental in introducing tea to Hawaii and he, at that time was director of the uh, Pacific Basin Agricultural Research Center in Hilo and Francis was visiting me and helping me with some uh, workshops in California and when we were driving through around the central coast of California he just commented, Mark you should look at growing tea here because this would be an excellent, excellent tea growing zone and he said I'm convinced that you would have Tea, he said, tea, uh, how do they put it, tea aficionados and tea connoisseurs are every bit as demanding as the finest wine connoisseur, and there are traditional tea connoisseurs all the way from the Mexican border to Vancouver that would love to drive around and sample California-grown tea. And uh, I got excited, and then Francis and I started a small project and he sent cuttings and all of that sort of thing. And I, but at that time, I, there was only one grower interested in working with me. She actually planted tea, and that tea is growing quite well in 2006. But then I got onto some other projects. We had some wavering problems with uh, uh, getting the rooted cuttings from the plant the material that he was sending and I just got busy with other projects and so it wasn't until about five years ago that I came back to uh, tea because we now had additional growers who were interested and I watched this meteoric rise in interest in specialty teas and in the diverse types of cultural related aspects of uh, opportunities for growers and new growers now who operation would be a good fit for tea and so I started working at about four years ago with a couple of dozen growers on some of these kinds of specifics that I mentioned to you earlier. The growing aspects, processing small batches, setting up a, uh, an attractive environment for uh, people to uh, enjoy with as part of tea agritourism. Now, now Mark, you are a California-based agronomist, but we want you to expand your horizons. We are speaking here in the Puget Sound area and we want to know how we can get you to help us produce high mountain cascades tea. Why do, why do you restrict your efforts to, to California when we've got all of this terroir stretching the, uh, north of you? Well, my wife will tell you I've been walking around with my mouth open the whole time I've been in Seattle area because I think tea would grow like a weed here. And you have much, if anything, better conditions for growing tea than we do in California. We have very serious challenges compared to different tea growing areas that, that are even different from the Mississippi conditions that Nigel was showing you because in California we have high pH soils and high pH water and high bicarbonates in our water and challenges such as those that we've learned to manage. We've learned to manage them quite well for blueberries and other very similar ericaceous which crops, acid loving crops, light tea and, and coffee and, and uh, blueberries and we can manage that quite well now, but up here you have much higher rainfall, more humid conditions, delightful growing conditions for tea. When combined with a mild climate, would be delightful growing conditions for tea, would be my take on this. I think Nigel may have other comments. Now, now let me put in, on behalf of us 
who are not Californians, uh, uh, that Nigel comes to our rescue. The U.S. League of Tigra is about uh, three years ago. Um, this was Jason McDonald and I, when we saw that the uh, there were various groups of growers around the states, but they were very secretive and not telling each other about what they were doing. They would uh, find something out and they would want to keep that information to themselves which is fine, but it's no way to catch up with the tea growing world. Um, the rest of the world has been growing tea for, well, in China, 5,000 years, but um, growing tea in the way that we know about growing tea, um, 150 years old, it really started with the British in, um, in North, North India. Um, and 150 years of research has gone into it, already. Um, I've got a chair at Toklai, which um, is the oldest tea research institute in the world. They've been going 111 years. There is a lot of known about growing tea. Growing tea per se. Um, and to put it in context, there are 55 billion tea plants growing in the world. Uh, most of them are growing pretty well, thank you. But in the States, you are catching up. You have got to catch up and, and invent new methods. But before you, before you uh, know enough to create new ways, you need to catch up on the old ways. So we've thought much better for all these disparate groups to be talking with each other and sharing uh, successes and sharing failures too. I'm a great believer in failure. Um, that is where you learn things. If you take your failure and analyze what happened, why it happened, and learn from it, then it's far more valuable than succeeding because you never really evaluate why you succeeded, you just go on. So that's why we set up the US League of Tigras, which um, started well. It went through a teeny bit of a bump, um, but has now been resurrected and um, the secretary of the US Tea League, of US League of Tea Growers, Angela McDonald, no relation to um, Jason McDonald, but all the McDonald's are related in some way past. But um, Angela is the secretary and she's here at uh, Le Brand Tea um, um, booth. So if anyone is interested in growing tea, and as Norwood said, We'll accept a grower who has a one pot. Uh, you are a tea grower. But if you've got a, a million pots or a million plants, then also very acceptable. So uh, uh, go along and have a chat with Angela and chat with her about membership. Now say again, what booth is that? Um, it's called Le Brand Tea. Le Brand Tea. Le, Le, Le Brand Tea, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any resources that could help uh, aspiring tea growers find or acquire property to grow tea? Hunches. Uh, uh, I think that Mark would be willing to tell you what you have to look for if you want a tea a property that, that will grow good tea. Uh, uh, you can be called on. You could volunteer, couldn't you? I could provide you some. <clears throat> I could give you some general counsel, and so could the local uh, agriculture extension office with Washington State University. Are you from Washington? Yeah. I mean, I'd contact your extension people here because they could give you a, some general orientation. And then you can also, I mean, local community societies and see some of the visits, some of the. Com Remember, uh, tea is a camellia, so a lot of the conditions that you're going to be concerned with uh, are very similar among the camellia species. I would think that uh, you are most likely, if, it's, if the land is suitable for agriculture and is supporting plant growth and doesn't have any serious shortcomings of um, soil depth or uh, poor drainage or some of those kinds of issues, you can probably get to the point where you can grow tea on it, even in extreme cases. But uh, it's a little hard to be more specific without knowing the specific site and the specific conditions. You want to avoid extremes of heat and cold. Uh, it'll take a little bit of uh, snow even and a little bit of 
uh, freezing temperature, but I mean much of this area here on, along the coast is again buffered by the temperatures. The Pacific Ocean is always between 50 and 60 degrees, so as long as you're within 10 miles or so of the Pacific and you have this ocean influence, you get a moderation of climate that's very beneficial, which doesn't mean you can't grow tea more inland. We have successful tea operations, and the one Nigel mentioned that Lipton put in in the Central Valley of California gets over 100 degrees in the summer. Uh, but uh, you start getting challenged with regard to the quality of tea, I would think, more in those circumstances. It, it's not impossible. But. Yes, ma'am. It is, it's shout. All right, you're all ready to go then. Yeah. It'll be easy here. Did you hear her question? She know. Yeah. We, I. I feel uncomfortable being too specific because we just haven't been doing it that long. I would, I would think that you would, be, you would find sites that are suited for agriculture. Any of the sites that are suited for agriculture can grow tea, but you were going to be challenged by acidifying the soil, acidifying the water, some risk. But we have uh, what are now pretty routine operations for doing those things that we do routinely with agricultural crops. So. Uh, other than that, you might be challenged with lim water limitations and serious water quality limitations. You have to avoid, for example, high sodium in the water or high chlorides or some of those kinds of things that can cause um, that can cause responses by the plant and and um, toxicity actually in, in many plant species. I don't know of a county where you can't do it, is what I'm saying. I don't know a place where you can, I don't know. Oh, in San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, but you can do it in San Diego, you can do it in LA County. You know, in LA County, there are Asian Americans that have been doing this for generations in their backyard and making their own tea. And you find this in the rare fruit grower meetings and so forth. Oh, my grandfather made tea, I remember his house, I go over and visit on weekends, and I can't remember when he didn't make his own tea from some bushes in the backyard, that kind of thing in L.A. County. So what I'm saying is all of those areas, will, the growing area will support it. You might look more carefully at the water and the water quality because there are some challenges with salinity and those kinds of things. Now, as to these specific questions about specific locations, let me give us some encouraging words. Uh, uh, the University of California at Davis, which is famous, as you probably know, for the great uh, school of, of, of viticulture and enology, uh, uh, grape growing and, and winemaking, is now launching a tea initiative. And the idea is to have, to have an institute which will be parallel to the, to the wine growing and winemaking institute, which will be located at UC uh, Davis. And uh, all of us, we don't have to be, we don't have to be Californians, God knows, uh, in order to take advantage of the expertise that's going to be freely shared by this institute that we're just now nurturing into being. Uh, uh, and so please know that just like we have a nascent uh, uh, newly uh, newborn U.S. League of Tea uh, Growers, we have a, a, a newborn uh, uh, University of California Tea Institute. And these are going to be very important resources for all of us who are gardeners or ex-gardeners or aspiring gardeners. How many of us here are like uh, uh, plant lovers and, and, and have, uh, well, that's, that's us, isn't it? That's what we do and love. Uh, uh, no doubt that's what brought us into the room. Uh, uh, and so uh, uh, those are good things to know exist if you're uh, 
I have north facing terrace in San Francisco where I cannot grow tea. One plant after another uh, uh, turns up its roots and breathes its last. Uh, mine is a purple thumb, not, not, not a green one. And Nigel has been of no use whatever in keeping my plants alive. Uh, uh, it, it is, it, it, they are fated to die if they come into my hands. Don't be like me. Uh, don't, don't put them in a north-facing place. And also, uh, don't rely on your thumbs when we've got Mark and Nigel that, that can coach us. Uh, if there are any people in America uh, uh, who, there's nobody in America who has coached more people in trying to grow tea than, than these two. Well, I, I sick I you mention, on them. I should mention that the University of Hawaii has an excellent set of downloadable publications on their website on tea growing, on small farms, and small scale tea processing uh, on small farm conditions. So. That's a great place to start, and they will start from a zero. And uh, they've been very helpful for us. We, of course, have to manipulate that because Hawaii also is more acid, a higher rainfall, uh, doesn't have the problems that we have with water quality, doesn't have the problems that we have with high pH soils. But they're great publications, and they're downloadable for the most part for free from University of Hawaii website. Now, now we have another question. Shout now. All right. I'm not sure. Is it working? It is working. Okay. If you aspire to create um, a boutique, agri business, cultural experience, tourism, where you'd have people come in maybe to a bed and breakfast and 50 experiences a year where they got to pick tea and process tea, mm -hmm. how much tea would you like to grow? How many? I think you could do a good job with a quarter acre, probably. It, it, I think you can enrich the experience by a little bit, you know, a, a row of each variety. I mean, it kind of depends how many people are going through it. But remember, an individual, especially a novice, isn't going to pick that much tea. We're talking about maybe a half hour. They're going to come in with a little basket full of uh, 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 tips. And, uh, you know, the first six leaves, we'll say, or uh, depending on how, what kind of instructions you give them. And then you can maybe be set up because you could have some, either your workers or do it yourself each week, picking tea on each day, a little bit of tea, so that then you can show them the different aspects of uh, heating, uh, weathering, drying. I went through some of these concepts yesterday in my presentation of how to do this on a small scale, but uh, if you look at the University of Hawaii Hi, uh, it's great to listen to you guys speak. Um, I have four acres on the Oregon coast outside of Portland. Uh, we have 250 plants right now. We have a bed and breakfast. We're, uh, we've been doing agritourism for many years. Um, we want to produce uh, much more... Get your chair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, my wife is the farmer, actually. I'm a herbalist. Uh, uh, I'm curious of uh, to do an investment into about three to four acres of tea and processing. What does that look like? Uh, do you guys have like a guesstimation of to go off of her question? It's uh, very hard for a person to find a farm for one. But then, what would be the investment of growing and producing that much tea? Thank you, Nigel. Tell about your miniature machine. Uh, I don't think that would be helpful because that's far too expensive. <laughs> um, you're talking about the uh, cost per acre to uh, establish tea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so not not per acre to establish the tea, but to process the tea. Yeah, kind of a start to finish, uh, even for just one acre. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a difficult question because the, um, the 
the scale of your operation really determines how much per acre it's going to cost. Because if you've just got one acre, it's a very different uh, situation to if you've got 100 acres. The, the economy of scale comes in very quickly. But um, uh, it's a scary number. <laughs> no, truly, um, if you want to go into tea and you look at the numbers, it's a scary thing to do. And But once you're in tea, uh, it's a money printing machine. Um, once you've got it established, and I go through this with, um, and each case has to be taken on its own merits because um, different costs come in. But you're talking about maybe $100,000 an acre overall. Yeah, between, yeah. you certainly won't get in under 80000 and you might be in for 200000 depending on your situation. Which means, because tea, is, you can start plucking it in year three, but you're not going to pluck much off it in year three. It's uh, year five to six before you get full maturity. So your, your outgoings are piling up in the initial years and your income is starting to come in in sort of year four. Your break even on an operation, a small operation, is going to be in about year eight or year nine. After that your input costs are very small. Um, primarily you have labour costs for um, harvesting and we're pretty assured that um, some decent harvesting machines will be coming along in the future. At the moment, a uh, tea harvesting machine is a bit like a hedge clipper. It's totally non-selective. Whereas um, in good plucking, the uh, plucker will be taking the two in the bud and leaving the one in the bud and the buds. And if it's three in the bud, they will just take two off it and break back the bottom and throw it out. That is selective hand harvesting, and that is what specialty tea is all about. Machines, at the moment, just go zoom and take everything. But machines are coming along, and um, I've been working with a, an Australian inventor since 1981 to make better harvesting machines. And he, I think, is just beginning to crack it. He's got patents pending on a machine which actually distinguishes mechanically between a three and a bud and a two and a bud and a one and a bud. So your, your harvesting costs will obviously come down. And those are the only real costs going forward between year seven when it comes into, into maturity and year 100 when it's really you know, time to replace it. No, so no. it's really uh, it's an industry for your children. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question for us. Uh, I'm just starting out. Um, do you taking into account our growing region? Um, are there specific varieties or species that are notoriously like easy or difficult to grow? Or are they? Just we don't know enough about that yet. Um, we, uh, we have multiple varieties growing in um, diverse situations that all seem to be thriving in the early years, provided that you give them adequate management, you know, and take care. In our specific case, we have to, as I described earlier, pay special attention to things like overall fertility, drainage, and then acidification of the soil, which you would be less concerned about, certainly in Portland or up here. Um, I would not counsel growers that I work with to plant one to four acres of machine harvested tea because I don't think that that would be val viable. That would not, in my opinion, make a profit for eight or ten years, if ever. On the other hand, I could be wrong. I know growers, for example, in Northern California who are themselves managing 600 plants something like that, and maybe getting, and also in processing it all themselves and so forth, and getting a return of around $20,000 in the third year, but that's gross. 
and that's selling at a thousand dollars a pound. So, how much tea can you sell at a thousand dollars a pound? That's that's a one question. I mean, some high-end restaurants, obviously, but uh, I would just be going very. I'd probably be going stepwise, and I and I in my circumstances and my. Uh, interest area, I think the small farm agro-tourism is, is more of an option. I would be real hesitant to get a larger plan in that. Particularly if you're having good success with what you're doing now, you might expand upon that theme rather than try to go to machine managed and machine harvested. You brought up the different uh, the different varietals, the different cultivars of tea and I think that you ought to know about the Camellia Forest Nursery outside of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, where they have a, a multi multitude of different uh, uh, kinds of tea growing. Uh, some Japanese, some Chinese, some who knows what. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a good name to remember. Uh, the, the people there can tell you where people are having luck with one strain or another uh, uh, and they'll be happy to ship to you as many of whichever as you might wish to have. Uh, so Camellia Forest is, is a good name to remember and we do have time for another question or two if we make it snappy. Who, who wants to go? Go, go ahead. All right. Where I live on the Oregon coast, they get twice as much rain as Portland does. So, and it's one of the wettest spots on the Oregon coast. We get about 112 inches a year. Uh, two weeks ago, it rained for, on us for three days and never even touched Portland. <laughs> uh, would that much rain be a problem? No, tea can take as much rain as you'll give it. But... Gotta it, go somewhere. But it must have a well-draining soil. If the soil's not well draining, it'll die. I've got mostly clay. Um, if you <laughs> I would put it on high beds and incorporate a lot of wood waste into the bed. You have to get it to drain. Sure. You, the, it'll kill the tea if you don't get good drainage. And if you have a heavy clay soil, I would incorporate as much wood waste as you can haul in there profitably and put it on high beds that can help a lot. Then mix in maybe, you know, normal fertilization and compost for it to provide nutrients, but the coarser woody material, which you should have in huge quantities, will provide help provide drainage. You can also use sphagnum peat to maintain a little bit of the, around the plant, a little bit of acidity and nutrient holding capacity, but I don't think you have any of those issues with a clay soil. What your issue is you've got to get aeration and drainage in there or the tea plants will die. Luckily, the whole property is on a slope down to the river, so it, it, it that helps. I'd still put a little bed and a little terrace, maybe, and plant on the hillside, and uh, but just watch drainage. It's your it's your key issue. Yeah. Thank you. Well, well, we don't have the time to ask these gentlemen about becoming a plant whisperer. You see, they they are the plant whisperers who have been imported specially for this occasion by the Northwest Tea Festival. Uh, and uh, it's the spiritual dimension of, of tea growing that uh, they are avoiding, you see. They just want to tell you about drainage and uh, I don't know. Uh, 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 but, uh, but we're going to have them back. Uh, and we will have progress to report because uh, these are perfect conditions for tea growing right around here and the scandal is that we're not growing more of it. Uh, uh, go forth and uh, prosper and prophesy. <laughs> Thank you.